affiliated with our people. She worked with a German scientist named Otto Hahn, and uh, he worked on the development, they, together they worked on the development of nuclear uh, discoveries, nuclear theories, and uh, he took a break during World War I from their work together to work on getting the German army chemical weapons. So you can see that uh, he was not a very nice guy, but it also shows you, you're going to see soon, that they worked together on the development of nuclear fission. And actually, she would hate being called this, but she is referred to as the mother of the nuclear bomb. She is the person who discovered, she and Otto Hahn discovered that if you enrich uranium to a certain level, it can create a very big explosion. And she got through the details. Obviously, Albert Einstein discovered the uh, basics of a lot of nuclear stuff, but uh, she and Otto Hahn uh, brought it to, to, to the bomb, bomb part of it. It gives you a moment to pause and also understand what would happen if the Germans would develop nuclear weapons before the Allies? So Otto Hahn during World War I was working to give the Germans nu uh, chemical weapons. You can just imagine what would happen if he would succeed in his work during World War II in giving the Germans nuclear weapons. Anyhow, uh, in 19 she lived in, uh, in Germany, and in 1938, uh, she realizes that uh, it's, this is not going to be a good place for Jews. And uh, she starts fleeing. But in uh, the same year, she and uh, she and actually not Otto Hahn, she and a different uh, and a different German scientist published together a paper that leads to this the discovery of nuclear fission and the bomb. Uh, it's interesting. The person who she discovered this with, who she published this paper with in the Na Nature magazine, his name is Fritz Strassmann. Now he is one of the only Germans to be recognized by Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nations. Because even though he uh, was German and he was not Jewish, he risked his life to save a Jewish woman and her son during the war. And so he's recognized by Yad Vashem for his work to uh, save a Jew. And he actually he refused to collaborate with the Nazis and he, he wished, uh, he wished against, uh, to, to work against them. But let me just take a step back. Why is all this important? Where did the Nobel Prize begin? How did the Nobel Prize begin? Alfred Nobel had his first invention, not his first, his main invention was dynamite. And one day his brother died and he opens the newspaper in the morning and they made a mistake. They thought that he died. Can you imagine the guy reads his own obituary in a newspaper? So he opens the, uh, he opens the newspaper and it says, the angel of death has died. Why? Because he invented the uh, dynamite. So they referred to him as the angel of death. And he said, is this how I want to be remembered? Do I want to be remembered as the angel of death? So he had that rare opportunity that most of us don't get, which is to know how you will be remembered after you die, before you actually die. And he says, you know, what? I want to change my memory. And he creates this prize for improving the world. Now, where did this prize end up going in 1944, in the midst of the uh, Second World War, it goes to Otto Hahn, who together with Lisa Meitner, discovered how to build a nuclear bomb. So it's kind of ironic, and against the idea, the foundational idea of the Nobel, that he got the prize, but nonetheless, she did not get the prize. Uh, now, but nonetheless, she, you know, she helped, she came up with the discovery. Uh, in 1944, the, so he, he receives this prize, and uh, she's already living in Sweden. She's uh, escaped the Nazis, and she's living in Sweden. And uh, she writes him a letter then in 1945, because she was his uh, co-worker, and he worked for the Nazis. And she writes, for him, she writes to him the following. She writes, you all worked for Nazi Germany, and you did not even try passive resistance. Uh, granted, you absolve, to absolve your conscience, you, you helped some oppressed person here and there, but millions of innocent human beings were murdered and there was no protest. And so she goes on that the, she tells him the only path forward for people like you is to acknowledge your responsibility for what happened and how you, by being silenced, bear responsibility for what happened. She then goes to live in, uh, she goes to New York for a short time. And this is very, very strange. But after the after the bombing of Hiroshima, she then has um, after the bombing of Hiroshima, she then is giving a, a hero's treatment. She gets on the radio with Eleanor Roosevelt. 
she did not want to be remembered for uh, for the atomic bomb. But nonetheless, when the honor was there, she she did go on the radio and speak with uh, alongside Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and uh, and and so that is something that she was remembered for. Uh, another very interesting thing is that when she got on the radio with Eleanor Roosevelt after being recognized, even though remember I said she was uh, she converted to Christianity, she got up and she said, "I am Jewish." So it looks like between the Holocaust and and everything that she saw from her German colleagues, she then had some kind of reawakening. Now it does get stranger because uh, she then goes back to Sweden and uh, she rekindles her friendship with Otto Hahn, who is the guy who invented, the, who came up with the, the nuclear discovery together with her. And it's interesting, they remain friends throughout their life. So they have this friendship before the, uh, before the Holocaust. Then he basically has the Nobel taken away from her and is the only one to take it and doesn't even mention her name because he's living in Nazi Germany, where if you mention a Jewish person's name, your work is going to be discarded. And he works with the Germans to build a nuclear bomb. And nonetheless, she uh, afterwards, she goes on and she uh, remains friendly with him because they knew each other for so many decades before. And uh, I guess human beings can be kind of uh, strange. But uh, it's interesting that this remained a sour point for decades later. For decades later, there have been journals and, and scientific communities that spoke out and said Lisa Meitner really deserved the Nobel Prize and didn't get it. She was nominated more than 40 times for the prize and she didn't get it. So of all the of all the people who should have gotten a Nobel, she is probably the most recognized for deserving it and uh, and and she didn't get it. So uh, it's uh, it just a, it just gives you an idea of how much other Jewish women had to work. Uh, there's research about who was on the committee. Then remember, the Nobel was given in 1944, which was not exactly a high point for the Jewish people. I mean, this is the peak of the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, so it's just an example of how hard it was for Jewish women to get Nobels for women in general, but also there was discrimination because they were Jewish. It's interesting to this day, the IAEA, the uh, the International Atomic Agency, has the Lisa Meitner Department of uh, Against Nuclear Proliferation, meaning her passion to making sure that uh, whatever she came up with does not create a bomb is something that uh, that that uh, is respected to this day. You know, does she? Uh, is she to blame for the development of the bomb? No, but she she did come up with the uh, idea of how to how to do it. It's interesting. She didn't get the prize because of the Nobel Committee. There's another uh, Jewish person, Boris Pasternak, who was forced. He got the Nobel, but he was forced to drop it because he yeah. So he was a Russian Jew, and he was uh, he was from a very assimilated Russian Jewish family, and he was a great writer. And in the 1950s, at the peak of the Stalinist era, he was actually awarded the Nobel Prize. But he was told, first of all, there was a huge campaign, uh, you know, so Soviet style campaign against him. And all of the authors in Russia at the time had to take a stance against their colleague and they had to speak out against him. And he was told, actually, that if he travels to accept the Nobel, he will not be allowed back into the Soviet Union, which is something I assume some people would be happy with. But uh, I I'm sure they had other threats up their sleeves against him, his family. And so he ended up declining it. So it shows you there have been cases of people who uh, should have or were worthy of the Nobel, but uh, didn't get it. And so uh, Le Lisa Meitner was one of them. The next person I want to speak about is really a, a, a truly amazing woman, uh, Rita levy Mol Montalcini. Uh, she is unique in many ways. She grew up in a truly Italian Jewish family that traced itself back to the Roman era. There were Jews in Italy and in Rome even before the destruction of the Second Temple, many Jews. And so she, she was able to trace her family all the way back to the Roman era. She was also a Sephardic Jew, and uh, she grew up in a really sort of 
very Italian, very Jewish family. You can hear the last name Levi, which is obviously very Jewish, Montalcini, which is more Italian. Uh, so she she's also someone that you know really, really was very, very Jewish. Uh, and she grows she grows up in Italy in the city of Torino. If you like the chocolate, you know the city, right? There's the Torino chocolate. So um so they they went a long way back, and her father was very into science and education, and he encouraged her to study that, but she was told not to do anything other than to get married and to, uh, you know, serve in traditional female roles, which did not prevent her from pursuing sciences. She actually had a nanny when she was a child that had cancer, and she decided she would dedicate her life to curing cancer, to studying it, and to making sure she can help people in that situation. So after her nanny died from cancer, she uh, decided she would become a doctor, and that's what she did against her father's will, meaning her father and her family wanted her to get an education, but not to actually uh, practice it. So she goes on in 1930, she studies medicine in the University of Torino, and then she starts studying uh, neurology and psychiatry. In 1938, when Mussolini uh, comes to power in Italy, she is kicked out of school because a lot of people don't know this, but she, actually there were race laws also in Italy fairly early on. And so, but in 1938, she's in medical school in Italy and she's sent out because she's Jewish. And so uh, that, that ends that. She moves to Belgium briefly to study medicine there, but then the Germans come to Belgium. So she goes back to Italy and continues her research in her family home. What do you do if you are passionate about science and the world has gone crazy? You're kicked out of medical school. Uh, you're being pursued by the Nazis. What do you do? Do you take a break? Do you continue? What did she do? Very interesting. These were her best years, even though they were the worst years for the world. She starts studying chickens and eggs that she has at home because they're growing chickens on their in their house in Italy. There were and a wealthy family. They had, a, 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 I don't know how big of an estate, but they had they had a land. And she starts studying chickens. And she studies the nerve growth on the young uh, chicks and eggs. And uh, that's how slowly she develops these uh, uh, ideas and research about how nerves grow. And she's studying on chicken. Usually they study in universities, mice uh, or dogs or whatever. She is studying with chickens because that's what they have there. And uh, interestingly, it says that she, she was studying on these eggs and whatever part of the egg that she didn't study, she would use for an omelet because it, were, it was the years of the war. And so that's what she's doing. She's uh, cooking the remaining yolks. And uh, that's why she famously said, you never know what is good and bad in life. Because in my case, something, this, something like this was a, a good chance. So actually, her greatest discovery was made when she was living, hiding from the Nazis, with you know a bunch of chickens and eggs at home and that's when she starts studying how the nerves grow on the little chicks uh and so that's uh, that's how she makes her big discovery uh in 1943 as the nazis advance she and her family go to southern italy to florence and uh, they with help of non-jewish friends they hide and even help the resistance against the nazis 1945, when Italy is liberated from the Nazis, she actually spends a year working as a doctor in a DP camp. I don't know if it was a DP camp for Jews, but uh, that's what she does. And the opportunity of her life comes in 1946. She becomes a, a researcher in St. Louis. And that's when she comes and discovers this, uh, what's called the nerve growth factor. So let me just explain how extraordinary this is. She discovers basically in what ways nerves grow. So she discovers that when there is cancer, the nerves grow faster. Uh, she really, her research doesn't only impact cancer, it impacts Alzheimer's and other diseases. She is the one, even basic basic things like uh, studying, you know, common, common uh, diseases depend on her research that was done, by the way, when she was hiding from the Nazis, studying on little eggs and chickens that she would later eat for dinner. Uh, th that is based on her research. Uh, and so anything that has to do with the immune system, the impact of nerves on ovulation, fertility, cancer, organ donation, 
all these different discoveries are based on her discovery and what's called the nerve growth factor. And uh, th that that's hers. Fun fact, I'll, tell, I'll talk about this a bit more later. She is the longest living Nobel laureate. She dies later at the age of 102. Um, she then, she's sitting at home one day. And does anyone here read Agatha Christie? Any, any Agatha Christie? Does anyone like uh, mystery and uh, stuff? Yes. So uh, she's, she's sitting at home and she was reading one of these mystery uh, novels of Agatha Christie. And she gets a phone call that she won the Nobel when she's close to the last chapter. And she says that she was actually, even until later, very upset because she missed the ending. Uh, but she she had a, a joy of life and uh, she was uh, very, very excited about life in general. And uh, in 2001, just realize how old she was, uh, she was appointed a senator for life in Italy. So she's, uh, and which is, it wasn't just an honorary title, actually had consequences. So she's appointed a senator for life. And she uses that power. She uses that uh, to advocate for others. She had a foundation helping women in Africa. And also, believe it or not, this was before BDS was a, a thing that a lot of people knew about. But when some people tried to start a academic boycott against Israel in Italy, she was uh, at the forefront of fighting it. And she used her power as an Italian senator to stop it. Uh, so even though she, uh, you know, grew up in in a scenario where she wasn't necessarily with a Jewish community, but she was very, very proud of her Judaism. She visited Israel often, and uh, she was there for Israel when they, you know, when they uh, came came for Israel. Uh, it, look, when you have such a long life like she had, when you live till one hundred and two, there's a lot of stuff that you get done. So she didn't just. Her life didn't end in 1942 or 43 when she discovered how nerves grow in her bedroom, but it also continued throughout her life in teaching that, developing it, helping others, creating a foundation to help uh, women in Africa, and uh, visiting the Technion. It's interesting because a lot of times when speaking about Jewish women of the Nobel, the issue of uh, a woman's role comes up, and uh, you see how different uh, Nobel laureates took different approaches. So you have uh, Rita Levy, interestingly, she came to speak in the Technion in 2000 and uh, late, like, you know, later in life. She was 99 when she came to speak. And she spoke to the women about the fact that she chose never to get married and not to have children. And she told them, you guys are very privileged because in my time, there was no such a possibility. You couldn't have children or a family life and be a woman in science. And so it's it's interesting to see how things have changed in many ways for the better, but also what difficulties, we're going to see what difficulties women faced uh, in science. The, 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 the field of science is really strongly discriminated very openly until, uh, you know, pretty recently against women. And so for her, she had to make that choice of not having a family life, but she did tell other Israeli women that, uh, you know, they're very lucky to live at a time where, uh, where you know, they don't have to necessarily make that choice. Uh, there's a street named for her in Rishon Letzion, and it's, interestingly, it's right off the Henry Kissinger Street, uh, who also won a Nobel, but uh, there's a street named for her. Uh, but she really, she became an icon because she's, first of all, one of the first women uh, Nobel laureates in science, and second of all, because her discovery really changed the field of medicine and how we uh, uh, study uh, nerves. I must say, when I was preparing this talk, I did not expect this to be the centerpiece of my talk, but I discovered something really, really astonishing, uh, and that is the next person I want to speak about. Her name is Rosalind Sussman Yallo. I never heard the name before, but uh, she's a New Yorker. She's actually the first American-born woman, first American-trained woman to receive a Nobel Prize in any science. Uh, there have been other women who came from other countries, but she's the first American-born woman to uh, win a Nobel in sciences. And uh, she was an Orthodox Jew. Again, you know, not judging how Orthodox, but she was an Orthodox Jew. And uh, she lived in Riverdale her whole life. She went to public school in Riverdale. And I feel also very honored. I always like when things are local. Uh, I feel very honored to speak about her here because she went to Hunter College right here. Uh, so the, I, I don't know who knows the history of that, but 
apparently there used to be a hunter college only for women and 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 then a hunter college for men so uh she studied in hunter college which was only for women uh so she's born in 1921 in a in a to orthodox family polish immigrants in the bronx and she goes to hunter college and uh there's a famous story of her, her mother used to say after she won a nobel that uh, she took her to a fair when she was three and it was time to leave the fair and there were two ways to get back home and her mom said let's go take this path and she said no let's go that way she's three and uh, her mom says no let's go the other way she sits down and she will not move and there's a whole commotion so her mother used to tell that story as just sort of uh, commiserating over how sometimes it was hard to bring her up but she used to tell it in a way of saying how she always had the way she believed in and she stuck to that no matter what which was one of the biggest lessons she gave in fact her last talk which she gave to third grade in public school. She said, no matter what you do, always follow the data, follow the facts. And once you have them, stick to them. Don't let go. And uh, that's what she did. Um, so her mother uh, raises her and she's, uh, she's uh, you know, having the uh, New York life. She goes to public school. She goes to Hunter College. And uh, eventually she, uh, she wants to graduate and she has a fascination with science. Now, in those days, I know it sounds crazy today, but even to go for anything basic in science, uh, uh, whether it was a fellowship, professorship, anything, research, uh, if you're a woman, you were discouraged from doing that. She was, that you were told not to do that. Uh, and uh, women were rejected often from, uh, from scientific positions. So what do you do if you're a woman in Hunter College and you want to pursue your dream of science? Uh, so first, She's told, oh, you should become a typer, a secretary, a stenographer. So she did, uh, I guess, I, 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 I wouldn't say she didn't have a choice, but she didn't. Uh, and she went to Columbia University, where she became the secretary to two leading biochemists. And once she's a secretary of these biochemists, she has sort of her foot in the world of science. And uh, but she's really she's told, like, even though she graduated at the top of her class in Hunter, she's told, are you crazy? You should not do anything in science. It's not for you. It's there's no place for women in the field of science. Uh, and and again, people her, her own teachers tell her to become a uh, to become a secretary. Now, similar to uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, sometimes in adversity, there is also opportunity. And what happens is in World War Two. All the men are recruited to the army, and a lot of university have difficulty filling positions. So there's a lot of openings at a time that, uh, you know, usually she wouldn't necessarily have these openings. And so she goes on and she is uh, willing to, to take any, any position that she can get. And uh, Hunter College is contacted by Purdue University. Here's a very good line you're, you're all going to enjoy. Uh, and they're, they're contacted by Purdue University and they say, look, we have a search position that we need to fill. Do you know anyone? And Hunter College say, look, uh, we have this lovely, lovely, uh, uh, brilliant person who's at the top of her class. Her name is uh, Roslyn Yallo. And they tell her, can you guarantee that when she finishes here and maybe once the war is over, you will give her a position because we don't want to give a research position to someone who then won't be able to get a job. And uh, they say, they say, look, she's, I'm sorry, this is Purdue University. Uh, they, they say, look, uh, sorry, let me clear that up. Hunter University say, no, we will not guarantee her a job when she comes back from Purdue. So Purdue tell them she is from New York. She's a woman and she's Jewish. There's no way she's going to get a job coming out of here. So uh, I, I, that those were things that people said those days. So they didn't take her because uh, they said there's no way she's going to get a job, even if she comes out of here uh, finishing because she's Jewish, she's from New York, she's a woman. There's no way that's going to happen. And uh, so she doesn't take the, the doesn't take that position, and they res they actually rescind their offer, which I'm sure they regret. But it worked out for her. Why? Because she then went to University of Illinois. Out of 400 members, she is the only woman. She's one out of 400. So just to understand how not simple this was. But as we say in Yiddish, it was bashert. Why was it bashert? Because when she is in the University of Illinois, 
she meets a nice Jewish boy from New York, from Syracuse, actually. Uh, his name is Aaron Yalo. Her name growing up is Sussman. His last name is Yalo. And uh, they're both, uh, you know, they're both Jewish Orthodox people from the state of New York. And he's actually the son of a prominent rabbi in Syracuse. And uh, they're both interested in science. So, uh, you know, it, you know, between uh, all of this, looks like a, a good shidduch. And indeed, they decide that they're going to get married. And uh, and and she she said, apparently, it took a world war for a woman to get a PhD, because that was the only way she got it, because, you know, there was a war and, and people needed to fill positions. Uh, so she meets this uh, fellow Aaron, and they start their life together. And believe it or not, he's a year behind her, but he gets a job first. So it, again, shows you what was going on in those days. And uh, he gets the job. First, there's a, a great uh, uh, researcher and, and professor at Yale and Columbia. Her name is, um, we're getting her last name. Randy's, I, for, I forgot her last name, but she, she wrote a book about this. And uh, she really speaks about how insane it was for a woman to get these jobs in those days when they, they, they just were not giving these jobs to, uh, uh, to uh, women. It's interesting, Randy and Fox. sorry, Fox, Randy, Fox. Randy. No, uh, if you, if you want her name, uh, here I'll tell you in a second. Um, her name is Randy Epstein, uh, and uh, so she, Randy Epstein, wrote a, a book about uh, also among other things, uh, Rosalind Yellow, and how like. It, they said no way in the world will a woman get a job coming out of a PhD program, but she ended up getting. But it's interesting when you look at her uh, and uh, Rita Levy Monticelli that you see the differences where Rita Levy knew she wouldn't be able to get married and have kids, as opposed to, uh, you know, in, in New York is also a different scene. So we have Rosalind Yellow, where she she was living in New York and she was able to get she was able to get married. She was able to have kids. She even, when she was raising her kids, she was able to have lunch with them every day. And uh, it, it, it's a different scenario, right? It's also ones in the 1940s, ones already closer to the 50s in America, which was a bit more progressive at the time. But it's just, it's just insane to see the kind of uh, challenges and discrimination that took place. So, you know, whether it's the Judaism part, whether it's the fact that they're women, uh, it's uh, it's really unbelievable. She then comes back right here. And again, I feel very honored saying this. She comes right here to Hunter College. She starts teaching and she inspires some of her students, became major, major scientists. And uh, she is back in New York. Then she takes a job at the VA in the Bronx, still around where she meets a Jewish scientist, Solomon Bernson, who becomes her partner in research for life. Very interesting. He didn't get into medical school. So he got a master's and a master's in science, and they both work in the VA. Supposedly, the room that they gave her for research was the janitor's closet. Uh, so, you know, she really didn't have much to work with. Uh, but here is where she comes up with the biggest discovery of their, they both come up with it, to be fair. And it's the biggest discovery of their life. And I'll tell you soon how absolutely amazing it is and how it really changed our lives uh, in every way. So in those years, the VA in general wanted to know how radioactive materials change medicine. Now, I don't know if you noticed whether it's an um, MRI, a CAT scan, how many parts of medicine are actually uh, directed by nuclear research, by nuclear technology. And so the VA in the 1950s, you can imagine, this is shortly after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, wants to know what good can be done with radiation uh, and what good can be done with all these, uh, you know, different nuclear discoveries that are being made. And that's when they go on to discover this technology, which is not known, not very known, but it actually, I'm going to explain how it affects your life. Uh, it's called uh, radio immunity. Uh, and this is how it works. Uh, basically, the idea is it attaches radioactive materials to your blood and allows for an extremely accurate counting of certain things that are in your blood. So for example, you went for a blood test and the doctor said you're low on vitamin B12. That's because of her discovery. Not only that, diabetes, people didn't know. You know how today people with diabetes, they give them insulin. 
people didn't know how to do all of that. And she and uh, she and Dr. Bernson, I shouldn't call him doc. Well, he wasn't a doctor, but she she and uh, 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 Mr. Bernson, Solomon Bernson, they go on to discover ways to detect and measure with a crazy accuracy everything that's in your blood. You take a blood test for most diseases and most measurements, that is thanks to them. And uh, whether it's measuring hormones exactly. She was the one who discovered you can measure hormones. People believe that hormones are not something you can measure. And she discovered that. And the whole field of endocrinology is changed. Uh, she just, so, so if you just stop for a moment, you know, it's like we speak about all kinds of innovations, but actually the person who invented the wheel changed our life in many ways more than other big discoveries. So she discovers how to measure in, in really extraordinary accuracy with a number, uh, anything that's in your blood. Even uh, recently, COVID-19 tests, it's thanks to her, uh, it's, it's thanks to this science of uh, radio immunity. Uh, very basic things. You know, when they talk today about the possibility of being able to detect, to detect cancer with a blood test, that is thanks to her. All these things that we have uh, with treatment of uh, AIDS, HIV, to discover anything that has to do, how many things do we discover by, by taking a, a small test that measures these tiny things? That is thanks to these two who did this, who had this discovery in the VA, in the Bronx, uh, without any bells and whistles. Now, very interesting. Uh, so, so everything, hormones, enzymes, insulin, which is a type of hormone, uh, how to discover type, uh, di type 1 diabetes, blood diseases, uh, uh, how to discover vitamin B12, hepatitis, all these things are thanks to their innovation. And we don't even uh, often know this. Now, another major part, and I think this is probably uh, the biggest part that they should get credit for, you do such a thing when you discover, you know, the cure, not the cure, but a huge step towards cure of diabetes, hepatitis, hormonal diseases, uh, things that can help with fertility treatments, things that can help with, you should make a lot of money. They made this knowledge public for free. That I think is, is probably second to most impressive after them discovering it, they made it public for free. And so people were able to quickly take it. Obviously, they couldn't you know, do the full research for every single field this has an impact on. But because they made it public access, then uh, everyone's, able to, uh, everyone's able to use it. So that was really, really an amazing thing. They refused to patent their work. And that, I think, is, is just truly astonishing. And there are medical discoveries being made today thanks to their discovery, thanks to their ability to have exacting measures of things that are in your blood. You know, when you go to blood tests and they give you a number, this is how many vitamin this and how many this hormone and how many that, that is thanks to them. And, and, and that's just really mind boggling. Uh, and to think that she did this, you know, just speaking about how being a woman in a public space was in those days, to think that she did this while keeping a kosher home, and uh, and raising two children. It, it, it's, I think there was a big conference in Washington. She went to uh, uh, eight days after she uh, after she gave birth. Really, to, to, to juggle all that is 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 kind of uh, unbelievable. Uh, and she did that. So uh, it, it, it's really just uh, something that leaves you at awe with what she did. And uh, you know, today we go shopping sometimes online. She had to shop and, and she, she just did a lot of stuff. And uh, it's it really, it's, it's uh, mind boggling. Now her partner, uh, 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 Salman Bernson, got an offer then from a fancier hospital. What's a fancier hospital than the VA in New York? Well, I, I don't want to get into politics. Also for full disclosure, my wife used to work for Mount Sinai, but sh he goes and gets a job in Mount Sinai. So it's good everyone here knows we're from New York. You know what's going on. Uh, and she doesn't think it's a good idea. Uh, he ends up working more than he imagined and uh, not related to that necessarily. Four years later, he has a heart attack and he dies. Uh, now, big rule of the Nobel, you cannot give a Nobel Prize to someone who died. That's a, a big rule. So uh, after the many, many awards she gets alongside uh, Bernson, 
you know, whether it's uh, the prize for their uh, breakthrough on diabetes or, or, you know, the endless fields that they impacted, uh, then eventually he dies. And then she, uh, people think she may receive the Nobel. She was recommended by many, but uh, there were not many women who received the Nobel by then. Uh, I'm going to, uh, people said that she would never receive the, the prize because the women who received the prize in the past were often mar scientists who were married to someone who also received the Nobel in the same field. So there was this discrimination and people are like, no way she is going to uh, receive the Nobel and uh, that her chances are pretty, pretty low. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, she did. And by 1977, she did receive the Nobel and uh, she, you know, deserves so much more than the Nobel. Throughout her life, she really was a living, uh, what we call a Kiddush Hashem. You know, she really sanctified God's name in leading a modest life, an honest life. She was born in Riverdale. Well, I don't know if in Riverdale. She was born in the Bronx. She died in the Bronx. And uh, she just led a, a modest life, a humble life and a life of just service to others. And she just showed people that uh, there are certain things that used to be impossible and are uh, now possible. And that's really something extraordinary that she gets a lot, a lot of credit for. Uh, the, the next person I wanted to speak to is actually a very, in many ways, a very tragic figure. Uh, why is she a tragic figure? She has a, a bit of a tragic life and her writing is tragic. Has anyone ever heard of Nellie Sachs? So it's interesting. There's a name Sachs. Has anyone ever heard of the last name Zaksh? It's common in Israel. It's spelled Zayn Kofshin. And it actually stands for Zaram Shal Kedoshim. Uh, if you have Yichus, does everyone know what Yichus is? It's like the word for like, you're the great grandchild of some rabbi. So the last name Zaksh was Zaram Shal Kedoshim. So Nelly Sachs uh, is uh, in many ways a tragic figure. Why? Because she's born to a prominent Jew Jewish German family. And she's very weak and sick as a child. So she doesn't go to school. She has private tutors. And at the, a very young age, at the age of 17, she starts writing and publishing. And she's, uh, so, so far, she's living the uh, German life of, you know, just being a high society in the sense of very accultured, very educated, and, and with her writings being published. And uh, eventually... She, she, she's doing well, but uh, the Nazis come to power and uh, she has to go into hiding. She goes into hiding for a while and uh, she flees to Sweden in 1940, which means that by then she was really very, very scarred uh, and uh, she suffered a lot. When she arrives in Sweden, there's a Swedish poet who knew her work and was in contact with her because of their shared interest in literature. And uh, they go there and they hide in Sweden. It's interesting. When she's on the way to Sweden, she's already scheduled by the Nazis to be deported to a concentration camp. So uh, it, it, she really escapes in the in, in the very last moments that she can. And she becomes a, uh, a Swedish citizen later and cares for her mother. Now, it's interesting that uh, after the Holocaust happens, after, um, you know, after she finds out what happened to many of her friends and family. Uh, she basically writes songs of lamentation, really heartbreaking songs because she just writes about everything that they've been through. And she goes through several very bad nervous breakdowns. Interestingly, one time, one of her big nervous breakdowns came when she is on a train in Switzerland and she hears someone speaking German. And she has, and you can imagine because you know, German Jews were in a way better off and in a way worse off, meaning uh, Jews in Lithuania were killed at much higher percentages than German Jews because they had no way of fleeing. It was the Holocaust just came and the killings began right away. German Jews, on the other hand, had more years to, you know, see the situation, but uh, at the same time, they endured much more psychological torment. We're talking about people. My great grandfather was in Berlin in 1929 and heard Hitler speaking on the radio and he decided to leave. But that means that you were subject to this kind of, of hatred for so much longer than uh, than other Jews. And, and, and that's something that has an impact. Very interesting fact. In 1962, because she was saved by a someone in Sweden, she writes a letter, which, you know, it's hard to judge a person in this situation. 
she writes a letter to David Ben Gurion in 1962, and believe it or not, she writes to him that uh, she would like to see Eichmann pardoned. Why? Because yeah, because she was saved by a German and well by a by a Swede, and uh, she doesn't see the need for revenge. And uh, again, it's hard to judge someone, especially if they were saved at the time for feeling that way. But it's it's obviously, you know, it, it's it's the, the diametrical opposite of what we saw when we spoke about Menachem Begin, right? Menachem Begin's motto was, we'll never forgive, we'll never forget, we want no normal, normalization and, and, and nothing, nothing to do with the Germans. Uh, and here you have a, a different situation, again, similar to... Um, Lisa Meitner, who uh, who was friends with Otto Hahn before the Holocaust, then he turned on her, stole her Nobel, basically, and uh, and then uh, worked with the Germans to develop the German Nazi nuclear program. And then uh, after the war, she writes him a very sharp letter and how all Germans are complicit in their silence. And uh, then they become friends again. So it's very hard. I, I, I'll say as a, as a tangential point, uh, I don't know what people here do. I don't know if people here buy German goods or German cars. Different people have different approaches to that. Uh, I personally don't even travel through Germany, Poland. I don't buy German goods uh, or Polish and or Austrian. But uh, I find it fascinating that uh, Eastern European Jews have a much different approach to this than German Jews. Why? Uh, I find that, uh, and, and I asked someone who was a friend of Eli Wiesel about his approach to buying German cars, and he says, you know, I have a Mercedes, and he would come to my Mercedes. Uh, German Jews were much more likely, often after the war, to buy again German Jews. This is just my observation. I don't have a study on this. To buy German goods and, and to, to be, you know, to consume German culture than Eastern European Jews who, who who wanted to have nothing to do with it. On the extreme, you had people like Abba Kovner who wanted after the Holocaust to go and kill 6 million Germans as a retribution. It was a completely different approach. And again, part of it has to do with how much, how German you are. And it's not easy to shake off a culture. Uh, my grandmother was not born in Germany. She was born in Shanghai to a, a German Jewish family. Uh, she had a, a book till her last day of uh, uh, Goethe, uh, of his poetry in, in her house. So it, it, it's much harder for Jews who were from Germany to sort of just say, you know, we're done. We don't want to see a single German uh, product. But sort of that, that kind of ties together the beginning and end of this from, from Lisa Meitner to Nellie Sachs, uh, you know, these different approaches. But she did win a Nobel for her work in literature and for really the lamentations and the heartbreaking poetry on the Holocaust, on the destruction of the Jewish people, which she didn't take lightly at, at all. Uh, and, and she really, it, it stayed with her for the rest of her life. So uh, I, to sum it up, I would say that what to me was the biggest eye opener is just to realize how much good so many of these people did. Uh, you take uh, you take people like uh, 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 Sussman Yalo, who who changed everything. They changed uh, or, or Rita Levy, you know, who changed the treatment of of diabetes, of cancer, of 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 uh, blood diseases. Who enabled us to have uh, tests for hormones, fertility treatment, uh, any number of medical things, and just to realize how sometimes one person can change everything and how blessed we are in our world that many of the things that we have today have come from people who worked hard in the past 100 years. And it's not distant history. Uh, you know, Rita Levy, uh, who, who lived a long life, died in 2012, even though she was born in, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever it was, uh, 1909. So these are people who really changed our life. And uh, never underestimate a, a, a person, definitely not a Jew, and their ability to absolutely revolutionize the world for, for good. Uh, so I think that's the lesson, to, to take a look and see how one person sitting in their office in the VA can completely change the world forever. And her choice to uh, make sure that the 
she didn't patent her innovation and that it was free for all and that allowed her to save millions and millions of lives so uh, you know between seeing the nobel winners who had to flee nazism and the nobel winners who saved millions you see the power of one human being one human being can either save millions of lives as uh, as sort of our brothers and sisters in the Nobel did. And then you see also what destruction one person can do, like the Nazis who uh, caused them to flee. Next week, Bezrat Hashem will be speaking about literature, Isaac Bashevis Zinger and Shai Agnon. I don't know if as, does anyone here know Shai Agnon? No. So uh, he is an Israeli writer. He's very famous in Israel. He used to be on the Israeli, I think, 50 shekel bill. And uh, after that, big surprise, uh, Bezrat Hashem will do a new series after that. Uh, which I hope will be as as successful as this and even more. And uh, I believe will be very much enjoyed. I'll, I'll t I don't want to be a spoiler, so I'll tell you next week. Uh, but uh, next week will be the last one about the Nobel. We'll do uh, Isaac Bashevis Zinger and Shagnon. And after that, God willing, a new series, which really should be very, very enjoyable. And most importantly, I wanted to thank everyone for coming, everyone who's listening online. And uh, Bezrat Hashem will continue next week. Thank you. Do we have questions or comments? No, we're good. All right, terrific. Thank you. Thanks a lot to everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, I hope it was uh, informative, enjoyable. Why did Han win? Did he work for Germany? Well, he, he won because she was in hiding. But why did they win? Why did, why did they give him a prize for?